Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 1,254 of the Juice Box Podcast. My guest today is going to remain anonymous. She is the mother of a 14-year-old child with type 1 diabetes who is bipolar, and she's here to tell us the story of what GLP medications did for her daughter. Please don't forget that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your health care plan or becoming bold with insulin. When you place your first order for AG1 with my link, you'll get five free travel packs and a free year supply of vitamin D. Drink AG1.com slash juice box. If you or a loved one has type 1 diabetes and you're a U.S. resident, please consider going to t1dexchange.org slash juicebox and completing the survey. That's all I need you to do. Head to the link, join the registry, complete the survey. It takes about 10 minutes and you will be helping type 1 diabetes research. t1dexchange.org slash juicebox. If you're looking for community around type 1 diabetes, check out the Juicebox Podcast private Facebook group, Juicebox Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes. But everybody is welcome. Type 1, type 2, gestational, loved ones, it doesn't matter to me. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Touched by Type 1. Touched by Type 1.org. And find them on Facebook and Instagram. Touched by Type 1 is an organization dedicated to helping people living with type 1 diabetes. And they have so many different programs that are doing just that. Check them out at touchedbytype1.org. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Dexcom. Dexcom.com slash juice box. Get the brand new Dexcom G7 with my link and get started today. Today's episode is sponsored by Medtronic Diabetes, a company that's bringing together people who are redefining what it means to live with diabetes. Later in this episode, I'll be speaking with Mark. He was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at 28. He's 47 now. He's going to tell you a little bit about his story. To hear more stories from the Medtronic Champion community or to share your own story, visit MedtronicDiabetes.com slash Juicebox and check out the Medtronic Champion hashtag on social media. Hi, I am a mom of a kiddo with type 1 diabetes. She was diagnosed at 3 and she is now 14. And we have been on quite a journey that involves both mental health and the way her metabolism works. And we've been through a lot and I just wanted to share our story. Cool. All right. We're just going to talk around the fact that you don't have a name. Uh, We discussed before we started recording whether or not you would have a fake name or not. We're not doing fake names today. Your daughter is uh, what? How many kids do you have? Only child? One of how many? I have three kids. My 14 year old is the oldest. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so she has a she has twelve year old and ten year old siblings. Any autoimmune stuff or other stuff going on with the twelve or ten year olds? They have a lot of stuff going on. Both of them are on the autism spectrum mm-hmm. and and have ADHD. Okay. How about you? Do you have any stuff? I don't have any official diagnoses. <laughs> you have any you'd like to make with Google and just your free time? <laughs> I find some of my tendencies that, that that I would possibly be on the autism spectrum. I don't I don't have an official diagnosis and right. I don't even know if they would give me one if I tried to get it now. You know, in the 80s I was labeled a gifted child, which I think is almost synonymous with being on the autism spectrum now. So Really? Who knows? <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of overlap there. Do you have any um implications in your life that stick out to you? One of the biggest things for me is that when I was little, I was very sensitive about fabrics and clothing and, you know, my parents didn't know what it was and they just teased me about it my whole life. Pretty much everyone has always teased me about it as if I'm just crazy. But now, you know, there's manufacturers like the Target brand has a whole brand of clothing that's seamless for kiddos that are on the spectrum or have sensitivities to fabric. So it's just validating to know that it's a real thing and... Mm -hmm. I still kind of have it and it's, it's small. It doesn't affect my life that much. I see. Okay. How about your husband? Any medical issues or stuff like that? Or ex-husband? Sorry, I didn't ask. Um. <laughs> no, 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 no other medical issues. Okay. Like that. The kid's father. 
the guy. I'm not sure what I was supposed to say there. I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, the kid's father, also my husband, same person. Oh, okay. <laughs> he has no medical issues. Okay. All right. So how about like autoimmune throughout your family line, his side, your side? When we had kids, we would have told you that we didn't have any autoimmune stuff in our family. After our daughter was diagnosed with type 1, uh, we recalled I have a great aunt who had type 1. Okay. All right. Let's see. Did, did the kids have any other autoimmune stuff like celiac or thyroid or anything like that? My diabetic kiddo, uh, she just started having a low-performing thyroid and is on levothyroxine for that. Mm-hmm. Oh, right. actually, my husband does have that too. Oh. Is his Hashimoto's or do we not know? No, I don't think so. He doesn't have a Hashimoto's diagnosis and seems fine. I have been described as low performing by my wife at times. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, the biggest problem you and I are going to have today is that I changed my room around and the thing I used to put my feet on when I was recording is I moved it. Now I'm just sitting here and all I can think is like, why did you move that? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do. Do we need to take a break and get you a foot rest? No, no. I'll make do. Don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) So you said you wanted to come on the podcast to share your story. What drew you to that idea? What drew me to that idea? Is that what you said? Yeah. Like what? Yeah. What makes you think like I'd like to tell a lot of other people about what's happening? So a year ago, my my type one kiddo started a GLP-1. She's on Wagovi. And I knew that that was pretty novel for, you know, a young teenager that with type one. Um, but we were desperate because we were really suffering in a lot of ways that I can get into in detail. Yeah. And I was starting to research it and I was starting to see it sort of, and when I say research, you know, I just mean Google. Right. I was starting to see it pop up on, on different, different support groups and, and different articles, a little bit of research articles about it, but not a lot. And then I heard your podcast with another mom whose daughter with type one was a teenager and was put on a GLP one and the success that they were having and her explanation and your explanation of sharing the story just so people know what's going on. Because I do think that this drug is going to revolutionize every area of healthcare, at least in our country. And it needs to be affordable. (laughs) We are on our third appeal with health insurance to get this paid for. We have to sacrifice so much in our life just to pay for the medicine. And we already went through this five years ago when insulin prices were sky high. Yeah, That's all very interesting. I can't wait to pick through every bit of it. So for clarity, you listened to the episode called 15 year old on GLP. Yes, I did. And what about your daughter's situation made you think about a GLP medication? Dexcom G7 offers an easier way to manage diabetes without finger sticks. It is a simple CGM system that delivers real-time glucose numbers to your smartphone, your smartwatch, and it effortlessly allows you to see your glucose levels and where they're headed. My daughter is wearing a Dexcom G7 right now, and I can't recommend it enough. Whether you have commercial insurance, Medicare coverage, or no CGM coverage at all, Dexcom can help you. Go to my link, Dexcom.com slash juicebox, and look for that button that says, Get a Free Benefits Check. That'll get you going with Dexcom. When you're there, check out the Dexcom Clarity app or the follow. Did you know that people can follow your Dexcom? Up to 10 people can follow you. Uh, Right now, I'm following my daughter, but my wife is also following her. Her roommates at school are following her. So I guess Arden's being followed right now by five people who are concerned for her health and welfare. And you can do the same thing. School nurses, your neighbor, people in your family. Everyone can have access to that information if you want them to have it. Or if you're an adult and you don't want anyone to know, you don't have to share with anybody. It's completely up to you. Dexcom.com slash juicebox. Links in the show notes. Links at juiceboxpodcast.com. And when you use my link to learn about Dexcom, you're supporting the podcast. Right now, we're going to hear from a member of the Medtronic Champion community. This episode of the Juicebox Podcast is sponsored by Medtronic Diabetes. And this is Mark. I used injections for about six months, and then my endocrinologist in the Navy recommended a pump. How long had you been in the Navy? Eight years up to that point. I've interviewed a number of people who have been diagnosed during service, and most of the time they're discharged. What happened to you? I was medically discharged, yeah, six months after my diagnosis. 
Was it your goal to stay in the Navy for your whole life, your career? It was. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I think a, a few months before my diagnosis, uh, my wife and I had that discussion about, you know, staying in for the long term. And, you know, we'd made the decision despite all the hardships and time away from home. That was what we loved the most. Was the Navy a, like a lifetime goal of yours? Lifetime goal. I mean, as my earliest childhood memories were flying, being a fighter pilot. How did your diagnosis impact your lifelong dream? It was devastating. Everything I had done in life, everything I'd worked up to up to that point was just taken away in an instant. I was not prepared for that at all. What does your support system look like? Friends, your family, caregivers, you know, for me, the Medtronic Champions community, you know, all those resources that are out there help guide the way, but then help keep abreast on, you know, the new things that are coming down the, the pipe and to give you hope for eventually that we can find a cure. And you can hear more stories from Medtronic Champions and share your own story at MedtronicDiabetes.com slash Juicebox. She has kind of a long story. When she was diagnosed at three with diabetes, she was always very spunky and spirited. By the time she was five, it was concerning to me. And I asked our endocrinologist about her behaviors. And he said, he basically said I was being a bad parent and that we just needed to be more strict with her. Um, and the, he, he said this to me, there's no correlation between behavior and blood sugar. None. That, fascinating. <laughs> so I, I knew that was not true. And we got a new endocrinologist immediately. Yeah. But then it was like, okay, so we know when, you know, when her blood sugar is low or high or going up or down pretty quick, she's moody. Okay. We get that. And we, when we lived with it through early elementary school and it was hard, but it wasn't, it didn't affect life too drastically. When she hit puberty at the age of 10, everything hit the ceiling fan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> everything. All of it? Everything. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> what happened? The very first thing, it was a month before COVID hit, and she was in fourth grade, and we found her laying on the floor in the middle of the elementary school, just like really depressed and was like, I don't want to live anymore. Mm. And she's this tiny little fourth grader. Yeah. And she was also was a boundary pusher. So our first reaction was all was our reactions with her at the time, which was like, get up, stop misbehaving. What are you doing? Which is not really how you should behave when someone is suffering from depression. But that's not what you thought it was at the moment. Right. Yeah. Right. We really didn't. So then COVID hit the next month. We really, you know, we were trying to see providers. Everything was on Zoom. Nothing was helpful. By December of 2020, we were finally seeing a pediatric psychiatrist. My child has walked in there. She has grown like a lot. She, you know, she's like five, three by this point. She's gained a lot of weight. Not like in a sense that I would have put her on Wagovi at that point. It was just enough to affect, you know, how you're, you're visually surprised. And I'm sure it was affecting her self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Okay. And she dyed her hair black and she just was drawing like sort of goth makeup on all the time. She was looking down. She wasn't making eye contact. She wasn't talking. Severely depressed. The opposite of, you know, her personality a year before that. Right. It just got worse. Yeah. So at this point, are you, I mean, it's obviously it's beyond like blood sugar fluctuations. And yes. Right. And you're thinking depression at that point? Yes. We're yeah. thinking depression. What do you do then? And have you been depressed or your husband in the past? Or now? Neither one of us had ever suffered from any type of mental health issue at that time. So it was all very new to us. At that time? And at that time. Oh, okay. <laughs> You're like, don't worry, I'm working on one right now. Right, right. Well, from COVID on, when my daughter was really sick, I was depressed and, and had to get some help for that because it was just so hard to deal with. Um, she was requiring 24-hour care. We got to a point where she was a lot of suicidal ideation. She was trying to kill herself daily. Like real, I'm sorry, I, I I hate to put it like this, but like real yeah. genuine attempts or like walking through the house going, I'm going to run into traffic. Like what, like what level of. Oh, yeah, no, it was, it was real. She'd always done this thing that we called going dark. Like her eyes would just kind of be vacant and she wouldn't be there and she would do an extreme behavior. And when she was little, it was like she would lay on the ground and kick and scream, right? Mm -hmm. By the time she hit puberty and she was depressed, it was like cutting or. I'm going to jump off this balcony or I'm going to go jump off a bridge. Yeah, it was very, it was very severe. Sure. It was very hard to keep her safe. I mean, of course she was in the hospitals 
a lot, but when she was home, we had to kind of be 24 hour vigilance with her. So you live 24 hours. Like if you looked away, she was going to hurt herself and it yeah. wasn't going to be something she could come back from. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One day I was, you know, having dinner, like serving dinner to my, my younger kids. And she snuck into my room, took my blow dryer, took it up to her room and put it in the bathtub with her. How did that not hurt her? What ended up happening? I think she forgot to turn it on. Every time there was an attempt, it, there's always like a, a silly undercurrent because she's a child, right? Like the first time I think she tried to overdose on medication, she used something. I can't remember what it was, but it was something silly. It was like, oh, that, that won't kill you. <laughs> I see. She just picked something that wasn't lethal. Right. Yeah, yeah. But not on purpose. She just didn't even know what she no. was picking. Right. Yeah, One yeah. point she was at her grandparents' house and she... Overdo- she took a whole bottle of lithium. So like some of it was very, very dangerous. Grandparents, but- somebody in your, one of the grandparents is using lithium. Yes. I haven't said that. We have a grandparent who is bipolar and is on lithium. Okay. And so we eventually got my daughter a bipolar diagnosis when we started seeing a flip between mania and depression. Mm-hmm. The mania looking like crazy nervous energy running around writing stories that were, you know, 20 pages long doing art projects in the middle of the night, a hypersexual fetishes. And we're talking, she was 10, 11 years old. I was going to say at what age? Yeah. yeah. Really, really strange and disturbing and awful. (laughs) Mm. Do you think that it's possible that my podcast will significantly decrease the population of the people who listen to it? Because I always think that not just your episode, by the way, but when people are talking about their lives, I'm like, no one must like have babies after they listen to this stuff. (laughs) Like everybody just must be like, wait, what did she just say? (laughs) You know what? Forget it. (laughs) I hope that everyone thinks exactly what I would have thought, which is that's terrible for that person. I'm glad it could never happen to me. <laughs> yeah. oh that, my gosh. I, I mean, that is the funniest thing when I think about my husband and I, when we got married and when we started having kids, we were like, God, we are so lucky to not have any health issues. Yeah. We're going to cruise through this thing. If we can just make a little bit of money, we might great. get a, might get a beach house out of this. Yeah. yeah right. No, I hear what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, so. no one tells you you're going to spend all of your free time learning what pre bolusing means. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, right. Or, or or what sexual mania looks like in a 10-year-old. <laughs> in a 10-year-old. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's terrible, terrible things. Uh, no one should have to know. Yeah, oh, my gosh. Um, which is why I want to talk about what has worked for her, right? Because right, right. I want it to work for other people, but really, I want to be able to afford it. <laughs> and she's in a different situation now, obviously. Yes. Okay. She's in a different situation now, which is the only reason I would be on a podcast or really the only reason I can talk about it without just crying. I was going to say, you'd just be banging your head on something if you, if you were still going through it. Um, I've yes. actually talked to people in the middle of things and they don't frequently joke about it. So uh, that's, yeah. that's usually the, the, um, the people who feel like they've moved through it a little bit. So, okay. Yeah. So like all this yeah. is happening, you get that, that bipolar diagnosis. What do you like? How do you get her to a different situation? Because well, that's I, what we were trying to figure I'm out. I'm going to tell you, like, I genuinely don't know what you're going to say. You did this thing. I don't know if you know the phrase, tickled my ass with a feather earlier. Because you said, like, um, you were like, GLPs are going to revolutionize everything. And now I'm just sitting here, like, wildly wondering, how is that going to tie into what you're saying right now? You know, <laughs> but don't rush ahead. Like, you're yeah, doing a good job telling yeah. the story. But I just, I, I, I can't wait. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Super excited. You know, my husband and I are, 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 are pretty well educated and we had a lot of resources available to us. So, you know, we were lucky in that respect. We did live in kind of a more rural area at the time. Mm-hmm. And so it was a lot of driving to get to the providers, but they were accessible. So we started seeing everybody, right? Obviously we have our endocrinology, we have our pediatric psychiatrist, we had all kinds of different therapists. We were doing something called dialectical behavior therapy. The abbreviation is D as in dog, DBT, mm-hmm. um, which is the recommended therapy for folks with bipolar. Um, this child was in and out of um, inpatient hospital stays. She did a residential stay for 15 weeks at a long-term facility. That's um, a third of a year. Yeah, it was a very long time. And I will tell you, when she came home, she was a little bit better, but not really better. Oh, and what, what, what size cardboard box did you have to move into after paying for that? <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have not had the best of luck with insurance, but in that 
time we were lucky, insurance did cover that oh, okay. patient stay. So they, they covered that and they covered the hospital stays, but they weren't covering therapy, which we had to do all of the time and everything was just out of pocket. So it was like, you know, mm-hmm. $200 a session, two sessions a week. Driving to and from, yeah, taking off time from work, I imagine, to, to make time for it, everything that comes with all that. Yes. Jeez. Yes. All right. Okay. I was, I actually was home with my kids for many years, uh, about eight years. So I was home with them during that time. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. I'm back at work now, which is part of the story. <laughs> yeah, I bet you are. I bet you were like, hey, hey, my long-term and short-term to-do list is get out of the house. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Yes. So, work feels like a summer vacation. <laughs> People are arguing at work. You're like, it's fantastic. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yes. It's so, amazing. So long-term state facility, marginable mm-hmm. like improvement? Nothing like you weren't like, wow, this was worth three, four months like that. It was worth four months because she did learn some skills and my husband and I did get a break. Oh, okay. Which is terrible because you miss your kid when they're away and they're not supposed to be away. I mean, she was only 12. A lot of the care and the training that we got was that, you know, the caretakers have to have respite. The caretakers have to have time to breathe. You can't, you can't care for a kid 24 hours a day, nonstop. Do you have any guilt during that time? Because I'm assuming, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm assuming at some point during it, you're like, this is better like this. And, but she's still somewhere <laughs> struggling and, and, you know, she's going to come back. So like, yeah, that would make, I mean, did that happen to you? The guilt? Yeah. For being relieved when she wasn't there is what I'm specifically oh, yeah. asking about. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, I had so, I had so much guilt to work through. One of the things with my daughter is that early on in our diabetes Um, we had tried kind of a low carb lifestyle. She just increasingly started hiding and sneaking foods. You know, once I realized that was what was going on, we stopped the low carb, but it didn't stop her behaviors. And she is a huge binge eater, especially when her mental health deteriorated and she was going into mania. Like she would just like, she was just jonesing to get into a pantry and rate it. Like just completely addicted to binge eating. I have to ask you something, and I don't want to ask this as a leading question, but I keep waiting for somebody to say they want to come on the podcast because they chose an eating style and it led to something that they didn't expect. Do you, I mean, obviously you don't know for sure. She's got other issues, but do you have that wondering? Like, did low carb make her feel like, oh, I'm just going to get a cupcake somewhere else? Yes. You feel like it did? Yes. And you're right. She does have other issues and her relationship with sugar is, I, it is not the same as what I've seen in other folks with type one and that, that don't have these mental health issues. She, I think she just has that addiction piece of her brain mm-hmm. <laughs> and sugar fills it. Any kind of dopamine. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm it. not, I, I, I don't genuinely don't mean to say like, you know, if you eat low carb, yeah. you're going to end up binge eating. Like I'm not saying that, but I have always in the back of my head thought, like, is someone going to one day be like, you know, I tried to make my kid be a vegetarian and now they just eat hamburgers on top of hamburgers or like, you know, like, <laughs> like that kind of an idea. And then you felt like you almost said that. And I just, I wanted to make sure yeah. that we picked through well, with that and, song. And that's how I feel about my child. I definitely have guilt that I tried to get her to do this, you know, basically diet that maybe wasn't best for her mental health. Definitely would have been great for her physical health, but was not good for her mental, her mental health. Yeah. Okay. You know, if people say they're going low carb, I don't say don't do it. You know, they'll be binge eating. Right. But it does hurt my heart a little bit. Be like, uh, is that worth what if what if their what if their mental health is more fragile than you realize? <laughs> yeah, right. Like it I, I see what you're saying. And I'm very listen, I'm very careful about it for a couple of reasons. One, because it's not talking about how people eat is feels like talking about Jesus or, or, yeah. or politics to them. You know what I mean? And I don't have that feeling about it. Like, I don't, I don't care how people eat at all. I don't want to give the idea that, you know, I'm like, oh, don't do this or anything because of that. Cause I don't think that's true, but you know, interesting outcome for her at the very least. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So she, now she's, so she's binge eating and mm-hmm. you're like, oh, Hey, you can have carbs back, but that doesn't stop it after that. Right. And we, and we took carbs, carbs back in first or second grade. So it was a long Wait. time before the mental health deterioration. So oh, okay. all right. All through elementary school, different types of binge eating. 
she always had really weird reactions to ice cream. Ice cream always made her quote, go dark to us. Wait a minute, just eating it or talking about it? Or what are you saying? Yeah, eating it. Um, the effect on her blood sugar, no matter how we dosed for it, even if we didn't even see her blood sugar change on the CGM, whenever she ate ice cream, she would go dark. Huh. Yeah. Is that something that you've talked about subsequently with healthcare professionals about like what that going dark thing is? Yeah. Yeah. Not in depth. I mean, we've mentioned it to the psychiatrist. There's just so much going on with her. I've told the psychiatrist so many things. Mm. I finally now have a psychiatrist that kind of believes what I'm saying. My last two did not believe us. <laughs> oh, what did they not accept from you when you were sharing? They all thought it was just like parenting techniques. Are your other two kids struggling with things? Like, I mean, not, you know no, what I mean? Not like this. Like, could you well, step like back this. and go, maybe I am making a mistake somewhere? Did you try <laughs> looking at it? Yeah, no, okay. I mean, I've read, I read a parenting book a week. Um, <laughs> I do, I'm, I'm sorry, not even not kidding. Funny, my, friends, it is. <laughs> <laughs> my friends make so much fun of me. I, I read a parenting book a week and maybe it's my coping mechanism. And when I got sick, my husband and I completely changed the way we parented. We followed this thing called the nurtured heart approach, which is just really, really a lovely way to think about children and to always give your energy to their positive actions mm -hmm. and not give any energy to their negative actions. Not that they get away with everything. It's just that you don't freak out when something bad happens. You just do the like calm consequence. Right. And then as soon as they're good again, you start heaping positive energy on them again. Okay. So you went with the gentle parenting. Yes. That's yes, under fire a little bit in the world right now. That's what? It's under fire a little bit in the world. Oh, the, yeah. yeah. There's oh, a yeah, pushback sure. on it now. What, what was your finding doing it. That's why I'm asking, what would you learn from it? Even when our daughter was sick over the last few years, after we changed our parenting approach, she and I and my husband have the best relationship. Okay. Like when her brain is not on fire from this illness, she is the best kid. Mm. Like loves to hang out with us. It's funny, is caring, is nurturing. Like she takes care of like, she loves to take care of like little three and four year olds that we have with family friends. She's just, she makes straight A's now. Like she is just wonderful when her brain is on fire. Not looking for a bridge to leap off of anymore. Nothing like that's happening now. Not anymore. Wow. It, it, it did happen last up until last year. Okay. All of that was still happening, but when, and when she was having episodes, but when she wasn't having episodes, the parenting techniques were working. Like she was lovely I and we had a great relationship. I am so like, you are, you're so good at this. I don't know if you're doing this on purpose or not, but, but like <laughs> I have, a, I have something in my head right now and I'm like, is she going to say this happened and then this happened and then that happened? Like I have it. My, I should write it down so that I look like, <laughs> hold on a second. I don't want to look like I'm, there's no way for me to prove what I'm writing down right now, but I'm going to write down what I think you're going to say. Hold on. Okay. All right. Hold on. Led to led to okay i've written down what i think you're gonna say and if it's what you're gonna say i'm gonna go get the fuck out of here when you say it just so you know <laughs> and then i'm gonna say you that, should oh, you should say that okay when I get right. there. if that okay all right by the way what are you a storyteller for like like for a profession or something like that i'm like is this no. witch ever going to eat the little kids or not this is crazy <laughs> um so seriously you're i doing, love that have you ever been on a podcast before i guess i have technically been on a podcast i ran for office like a long time, a few years oh, ago. Oh, you know how to talk to people. I see what's going on here. Okay, all right. <laughs> I hope all right. so, I, but I don't think I'm that great at it. No, listen, you're doing great for me. Ah, thank you. I have none of that, like, you have to talk pressure, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, I, I, which no offense to the people where I have that that pressure, but I, I, I enjoy not having it once in a while, too. All right, all right, all right. I'm sorry. Keep going. It's okay. We've just been through so much. There's so much to say. Yeah. And I think I've, I've practiced telling the story because I've had to write the appeals to the insurance company so much. Well, that's so interesting. Started, yeah. And you've yes. had to repeat it to doctors who didn't believe you over and over again, too. Yes. Which is mentally exhausting. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're right. Like, I mean, it, it would be different if like somebody like got you one day and you're like, you know what? They're right. I'm not, I'm getting this wrong here. But like when you keep saying like, look, this happened and this happened and this happened, it, it does make you feel like you're out of your mind. Yeah. 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 It, you know, it was really hard. And, and my husband is great and we're on the same page, but when we started this new parenting technique and approach, he basically didn't talk for like two or three months. He was like, I don't know how to talk to her without just correcting her constantly because she was so 
fiery and oppositional and hard to talk to. Yeah. Fiery. What a great word. On top of all of that, she had, you know, she had a pump and her CGM and she did not, she was just more than burned out on diabetes care. And we could not get her blood sugars under control because I don't know how to put this. She wouldn't allow us. Like she wouldn't tell us what she was eating. She would hide food. She would constantly, constantly eat food and deny it and not dose for it. And I mean, we were just battling 400 blood sugars all the time. Was she able to weaponize her mental health issues? Yes. To keep you away. Like almost like a little terrorist. Yes. Like if you do this, we're going to do that. That kind of thing. Absolutely. And then as as she got more sick, she weaponized her pump. Two times she tried to kill herself by overdosing on insulin. Mm-hmm. And she get did she get the insulin in? Yes. Yeah. Then how did you manage it? We might have used glucagon one time and food the other time. Okay. Because once she got really low, she kind of lost the urge to die. She was just like, I feel like crap. Make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> that makes it go away pretty quickly. The, yeah. 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 Like, so if and you I can, don't know. Oh, know that's interesting, isn't it? Well, isn't that interesting? Because isn't that really interesting? You, you know, like, like, because if someone's trying to take their own life, it, it's going to happen instantaneously, normally. Right. But I guess if you do it in a in a way that gives you time to re, reconsider, maybe there's that part of your body, that part of your brain that wants to be alive. It's like, whoa, 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 hold on. I don't want to feel like this anymore. It's in, is that how right? You, it's that, like yeah. death is fine, but feeling bad right now is terrible. Not okay. Interesting. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. So she did that, and then a couple times. Well, often when she was at these hospitals, you know, these hospitals are busy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The child uh, nurse ratio is not very good. um, So she could get away with a lot. So like one night we sent her to a hospital and every time I had to fight to keep her pump on, of course. And then the pump had a lock that she wasn't supposed to know. And then inevitably she would watch a nurse put in the lock and so she would get it. So we'd have to warn them not to let her watch that. And then... One night she went to a facility. I told them she binge eats. They needed to control how she has access to food. So they're like, oh yeah, we're still on COVID protocols. She just gets a tray. It's fine. Well, the tray was actually a cart with like three kids foods and like all these condiments. So she drank a glass of maple syrup for dinner without dosing for it, by the way. Yeah. And then um, actually for some reason, oh yeah, they made us. I think that was the time they made us take her pump off. So she was back on Lantis before the syrup. The ner- she was low and the nurse didn't give her Lantis because she was low. So I had already called multiple times trying to fix that misunderstanding. Mm-hmm. The endocrinologist said fax the place. They still wouldn't give her Lantis. <laughs> I said, you're going to kill her. You're going to send her to the hospital to like the ER. This happened all night long. And then she woke up and then, so she had the glass of maple syrup for dinner I think she even, and then ate the dinner on top of that. And then she, of course she woke up at like seven in the morning and her blood sugar was over 500 and they're like, oh, we're going to send her to the ER now. Yeah. They didn't want to be involved. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And they didn't understand the Lantus was the background insulin and what they were fearful about during the low would have been the fast acting, not that, et cetera. Like none of that. Exactly. Yeah. It made any sense to them. And then, exactly. then once the number hits a certain thing, they're like, oh, we're out of this. We can go put this on somebody else. Yeah. 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 You're probably right. That was probably what was going through their heads. But I mean, when we'd been through this before and we were at the point where we didn't want the child in an ambulance anymore because none of the ambulance bills are covered by insurance. And so, and they just quadruple charge what they should for them. Right. Yeah. Now suddenly it's a $700 Uber you're in. Yes. It's exactly what it is. (laughs) (laughs) So we were not happy about that outcome. So she, she did weaponize her pump and her insulin. And then when she was at her 15 week stay at a residential facility, she refused insulin. And I don't know, they were like, well, we can't make her take it. If she refuses it, we can't force her to. How old was she? 12. Oh, well, why could they not force her to take it? (laughs) I don't know. They seem to think it was a legal liability. (laughs) This is the other, by the Um, way, over the years, the conversations I've had around mental health facilities and type one have never been uplifting. You know, like even if you're, you're lucky somebody let her in from what I understand, you know? Well, and I will, let me tell you this, this, so this facility we're at, I actually think it's a very good one. Mm -hmm. One of the kind of the vice president 
folks has type one and is on a pump. And she has been an amazing advocate for the kids with type one. And they have a lot of type one patients and they let them bring their pumps in. Oh, okay. So that was amazing. But that's when I started noticing this overlap between kids with these extreme behavioral, you know, issues and And having type one. I was like, there shouldn't be that many type one kids here. There's only 20 kids here. The word gets out that we let type one kids in here. And then you get them all together and you start thinking like, man, their issues all seem so similar. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, but of course everything's private, so I can't really, yeah. They won't much tell me very can. much, right? but I'm just noticing it, right? We're just noticing it as we go along. And it's clear that her behaviors and her blood sugar are extremely related. And it's also clear that her behaviors with high and low blood sugars are not the same as uh, my nephew also has type one. How long has your nephew had type one for? He was diagnosed two and a half years ago. Just recently. And nephew on your husband's side or on your side? Mm, This is on my side. Interesting. And the, the, the bipolar grandfather is yours? Nope. Husband's. Oh, you got the, you got the stew. You got the whole, I see what happens. Okay. You're so lucky. Yeah. Boy, this should have been the questionnaire on your first date. (laughs) Right. Yes. Yeah, don't put me in charge of dating. It won't be as sexy. I'll be like, <laughs> wait, you got a great grandmother with celiac? My father is not romantic. My, yeah, no, no, wait, wait, wait. My great grandfather's got, no, I'm not having a baby with you. Never mind. <laughs> nope, no, we can date if you want. We're not getting married and having kids. I don't like the way this is looking between the celiac and the, uh, and right? I got, I got a little inflammation over here with the, with the bipolar thing. And then I, I got, I got, I got a thyroid thing with my mom. Uh, no, 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 we're good. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. You laugh, but that guilt hits you, hits you too. You're God like, damn right. It does. <laughs> and I'm just telling you, give me in a time machine. I, I run Kelly through a real quick questionnaire and I'm like, mm, <laughs> we can still go to this movie if you want, but, uh, I'm not paying. <laughs> <laughs> adoption for us people adoption. yeah yeah i'm gonna do something very 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 upsetting in the middle of this movie so you never want to go out with me again oh uh, don't worry no. i did i did that <laughs> not even on purpose it just happened and yeah, anyway <laughs> it's such an odd thing to think you meet fall in love with somebody and you know no kidding like on their side there's this and on your side there's that and then one day this is going to happen and there's a reasonable likelihood that all of that led to it yeah. just such a strange thing you know what i mean it is it is so strange and i know everyone probably thinks this is about their child but my child is she is superwoman like she is a force to be reckoned with i imagine <laughs> yeah and the fact that she's overcoming all of these things in her life you know, that just adds awesome. to your character. No, of course. Not that I would wish it upon her. That's no, the other side of what I just said, but I hear what you're getting at. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it, it's, I mean, you called her fiery. I couldn't tell if you were like, you have no idea. Or if what you meant was like, you know, she's got a lot of like backbone and spirit, or maybe it's a mix. All of those things. Yeah. yeah. All of those things. Awesome. So, um, her, you know, her, her grandfather, who does have bipolar, he was not diagnosed until he was retired. He just, he was just a very successful, happy person, you know, had a surgery and then fell into a depression and, and that's when they figured out. Whoa, the Bible and hold on a second. No, wait, wait, wait. So never, never, never had any mental health issues through his entire life. Right. After he retires, has a surgery. Can I, can I know a little bit about that? Is it heart, heart related? No. no. Okay. I don't remember what it was. It wasn't, it wasn't even a big deal. It was just the fact that he went under like it can trigger something and kind of came back out a different person. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Keep your bunions and, kids. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Right. Honestly <laughs> to him, like once he got treated, he takes his medication. He does not really, he does. Think okay. It's a big deal. Thinks right. it might be a misdiagnosis. Just oh, about his life. he, he, he thinks he might be misdiagnosed as bipolar. Right. That's, that's what he, that's how he feels. I gotcha. Well, I don't know. All this is But the so... medication works for him. So yeah, that's great. great. So perfect. <laughs> I'm sorry. You were saying something and I waylaid you. I apologize. Um, oh, that's okay. Yeah. So he, um, he has bipolar and he doesn't have any autoimmune issues, but his relationship with sugar is interesting. It's always, you know, he's, he has a sweet tooth. That's what we say, right? Mm-hmm. Has a sweet tooth, but it's, it's a pretty intense sweet tooth. And he was the first person I knew to go on Wagovi. Okay, so he had a weight issue at that point? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. And he starts taking Wegovy for for weight. How long goes? It has to be in the last couple of years, right? Yeah, he was the first person. So it was like three years ago. Okay. Like he was, he has really great doctors, and they're like, "Oh, it's new. It's groundbreaking." So he went on that, and very good for him. Very successful in terms of weight loss. You know, all of you've heard all these stories. All of his blood work came back better. He couldn't walk. His ankles, his knees hurt. All of that went away. Now he can walk happily. He was pre-diabetic. He's not pre-diabetic anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, partially speaking, I have that story. Like you know, some uh, yeah. some of that. I'm literally sitting here right now in a pair of shorts, looking down and thinking, whose legs are those? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in that part where I'm like, I still don't even look like me. You, you know, Isn't that crazy. Um, yeah, no, it's it's nuts. So he goes through the process as you do. You you start slow. They ramp him up. He loses. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much weight he lost over time? Uh, I don't. I would guess maybe in the 60 to 80 pound range. Okay. And he now looks like average build or do you, do you look at him and think, wow, that was a lot of weight you lost, but if you lost more, it would still be okay. Yeah. He's just average build. He's average. He's build a tall, build. he's a tall, big person. So, okay. but yeah, like average, like not, not overweight. And he's, he's still on it as a maintenance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And so what do you think, did he have any other changes in his life besides his weight? He's a lot happier now. He's always a happy person, mm -hmm. <laughs> but he's a lot happier now. Interesting. Do you think just because he feels and looks differently or do you think there's something else? I don't know. All right. I mean, definitely feels and looks different, right? Like right. that definitely helps. And I do think he was getting depressed because he couldn't walk. Yeah. I don't know if there's something else happening. I know with my daughter there is. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know about him. So you see him have this experience with the Wegovy. Your daughter has a similar situation with the, and, and I'm assuming you also saw with him the arresting of the desire for the sugar, right? Yes. That's got to be what yeah. attracted you first for your daughter. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I saw him go on it. And then I have two very good friends, a close group, group of girlfriends. Two of them went on GLP ones. Both of them, um, really struggled with food noise. Mm -hmm. Do you know that term? My wife uses that term. Yeah. 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 Food noise. Like I just always want to eat. I'm just always thinking about my next meal. I'm just kind of, right. kind of obsessed with it. That was the big thing. This medicine cuts down on my food noise. I don't think about it that much. And oh, this other friend stopped biting her fingernails because it just takes away like your compulsivity, your impulsivity. Interesting. Or compulsions. And that's my daughter's extreme, was extremely impulsive. Mm -hmm. And compelled to do crazy things in the moment. When she was really sick, she was pushing boundaries. Like one day when she was really little, she said, what's hitchhiking? And I was like, we were like, oh, this is hitchhiking, but it's pretty dangerous. So people don't do it anymore. You know, you can't do it. And the next day she went out in her neighborhood and hitchhiked. Did she get picked up? Well, luckily it was a, a neighbor's husband. Who, who was like, um, I don't know if you've heard the stories about the house up the street, but I got the, the little girls out in the road trying to thumb a ride. So I'm going to pick her up yes. and yeah, yeah, take her home. I got you. No, no, I, it's nice. Yeah. of him. Did he take her for yes. a lap first or did he just bring her right in? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, he was just kind of like shy and awkward and just dropped her off. And then the <laughs> wife called me later and said, I'm so sorry he didn't come in. You know, I just wanted to let you know what happened because I had no idea. I didn't know she was gone. I didn't know she'd come back. It was so quick. I love that you can do the voice where women apologize for their husbands. I didn't realize that was a voice that people could just snap into. I'm sorry he didn't come in. He's a, he's feral. He didn't know. He just he did push her out of the car gently, if in case you're right. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> ridiculous. So you have two friends started GLPs. They had these. They lost weight as well. They had a satiation uh -huh. change. They lost weight. One of them was having problem with their liver. The liver enzymes were better. The cholesterol was better. One of them has like a, um, a kidney disease. The numbers for the kidneys were better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything. I, you should see my blood work. It's legit. I bet it's beautiful. Oh, yeah. It's, it, it really <laughs> yeah. does. The doctor, she mumbles to herself, looks perfect. It's beautiful. Like, you're, like a kid, she said <laughs> last time. I was like, in my ear, I was like, too sexy. Back up a little bit. And because right? she was like listening to my heart. <laughs> She's listening to my heart. And she goes, like a kid. And I was like, hmm. Say that from wow. over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, see, it was wow. just really like fantastic. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Keep going. What, what else did you figure okay, out? Okay, so 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 my my kiddo is suffering. They are bipolar. They are manic, depressed, manic, depressed, hypomanic. All these all these things we cannot get under control. You add the blood sugars on top of that. We can't get them under control. 
it's just, it's just impossible. You know, like we know all the techniques we've listened to all of your podcasts. I've read all the books. Like I know how to manage diabetes. My poor nephew, when he got diagnosed, we were able to, to help help their family. No problem. Cause you had the tools, you knew the stuff it worked on him. Wouldn't work for your daughter. Exactly. Yeah. You are, you are embroiled in what is classically known as either a show or a dumpster fire. Am I right? (laughs) (laughs) That is exactly right. Gotcha. That is exactly what was happening. Okay. So of course in the mental health space, we're trying different medications. You know, they put them on mood stabilizers and antidepressants and different things to bring down mood and bring up mood. And most of them increase the appetite. Mm -hmm. So we know that. So we're like, we don't care about appetite right now. We just want this kid to feel better. Sure. So, so we couldn't find any medication that would work. It was like, it would dull her spirit a little bit. And there are some that would make her so drowsy. She would sleep a lot, but nothing was like curing the darkness Mm -hmm. and the mania and the depression. Like nothing was touching it. Lithium had worked for our family member. So I was fighting to get her on lithium. Doctors do not like to prescribe that for young people. Um, Doctors don't even like to diagnose bipolar in young people. There's a debate on if you can even have bipolar as a young person. So look at all the stuff you've learned that you didn't want to know about. (laughs) <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've read a lot of books on that and I definitely did not want to read those books. So finally we got her bipolar diagnosis. You know, I told you I had a psychiatrist who was not believing me. And I was like, you know, this child is really sick today. This child, this is the day the child ran to jump off a bridge. I had the child in the car. They, they pulled the steering wheel trying to run us off the road. Like it's too dangerous. Jeez. I need something and we need to change the medicine. We need to change the medicine. And the doctor would say, do you really think a pill is going to fix all this? <laughs> did you did you just go, uh, I don't fucking know, but don't you think we should try something? Right, <laughs> yeah, right. Like, what do you want me to try? Because yeah. we've tried everything. We've tried every parenting method. We've tried every type of therapy. I I've just wrestled through. a steering wheel out of an 11-year-old's hand. Can we? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like let's go for yeah. something here. Because I mean, yeah, living in a cave is my next idea. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, right. it was, I mean, the plan, it was like, because because at this point, my child is full grown, right? Like mm. she is strong in my size. And if she's dark and she wants to do something, I can't physically restrain her. For for a year, I was physically restraining her from jumping out windows. Yeah. And this is not just like being bratty. Oh, I think I'm gonna jump out the window. This was like, I need, no, I need to do this right now. I need to kill myself and be out this window. Mm. Jeez, that could something. And, and nobody understood it until they're in the moment. I remember being at a festival with my brother and best friend and they had never seen my child go dark. And she went dark and she just walked out into this lake. It was not a lake that people swim in. Like everyone was wearing clothing at a festival. And she just walked into the lake and just sat there and stared into space. Those people were like, oh, is this what you've been talking about? Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then they go, you should get a therapist right now for yourself. Because that's what I would have said. Yes. Everyone, yeah. everyone said that. And I did yeah. very, very happily. Yeah. There was a lot of, what are you guys doing for yourselves? My husband and I had to figure out self-care because really before that we'd been spoiled and you know right no i i i, I take your point oh jeez. <laughs> all right listen go ahead do it say the thing <laughs> <laughs> so i'm fighting i'm fighting for lithium the child is getting sicker and sicker more dangerous behaviors binge eating she weighs probably at, at one point she was like 240 at what height at what age she was five six, five seven, and thirteen. Okay, so she was significantly overweight then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, my husband's not overweight, but very tall dude, and his clothes weren't fitting her, and that was, I think, the first time she realized that she was very overweight. Very mm-hmm. upsetting. So, but, but we couldn't get her stable. Like I, I didn't care about her weight. I just wanted her to feel, of course, like she wanted to be alive. I understand. Oh, it was so hard. So last June, June of 2023, she went to another facility and it was one we'd been to before. You know, the doctors, they see the child once, the child, the child is there five to seven days. You know, they're not like a, like a primary care doctor. They don't see these children a lot. They're just trying to get them stable and out of there. They're usually not the best doctors, but this one actually listened to me. <laughs> And I said, you know, we have a relative that lithium really works for him. Can we try lithium? And he said, well, yeah, lithium is the gold standard for bipolar. I'll prescribe that for her right now. And I about fell out of my chair. And we started the child on lithium. And 
the suicidal ideation stopped. Wow. That's great. It was great. Yeah. It was really, really great. Very scary because it felt like this is what I've been fighting for. And it was like the last hope. The suicidal ideation stopped, but all the other behaviors didn't stop. Like she was still going dark and she was still really anxious and weird and binge eating and fidgety and it's hard to describe. (laughs) No, I I feel like you're doing a good job. Don't worry. Okay. Okay. So the other behaviors didn't stop. So she was not trying to jump off a bridge, which was great, but she was still like obsessive and would get crazy looks in her eyes and just be like, mom, 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 mom. I really, I really have to, I really have to do whatever the thing is. Mm -hmm. So the next month after that, I put her on Wagovi, the GLP one. In July of 2023, by September, so two months later, so we're only on the second level dose of of Wigovi. 0.5 at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. You start 0.25, then Uh 0.5. Right. Okay. Uh Uh-huh. By the point, by that point, she was a different person. How? She was what I would say herself. She did not have that darkness her like huge, wonderful, fiery personality was just there all the time without the darkness. Like she was just sweet and fun and could listen and talk and could go to school and well, and could function at school. She had missed basically all of sixth and seventh grade because anxiety would hit her within 30 minutes of being there and she'd be stalking the halls trying to find something to hurt herself or or do or not feel good. So she'd missed like all of sixth and seventh grade. Eighth grade, she went to school every single day. Was she losing weight at the same time? Mm-hmm. Yeah. She lost all the weight. Okay. Can I read to you for a minute while you collect yourself from our yeah. <laughs> our computer overlords, chat GPT 4.0? Hold on a second. I've asked it, could GLP have a positive impact on bipolar? That is all I asked it. GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, agonist commonly used for the treatment of type 2 diabetes and weight management have shown some promise in neuropsychiatric conditions, including bipolar disorder. While the primary action of GLP is to regulate blood sugar levels and appetite, there's growing interest in its potential effects on the brain due to its neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory properties. So I wrote down, took GLP, led to less inflammation, reduced mental health burden. That was the three things I wrote down. Yeah. Guessing. It goes through what uh, neuroprotection, cognitive function, mood regulation, inflammation reduction. Research is limited right now to animal studies. Human studies are in limited clinical trials directly investigating the impacts of GLP-1 receptor agonist on bipolar disorder. Mechanical understanding, potential mechanisms of GLP-1 receptor agonist in Neuropsychiatric conditions are being explored. A comprehensive understanding is still lacking. More research is needed to see how these medications interact with the brain and influence mood and cognitive function. But you, not a doctor, not a researcher, you'd bet a couple dollars that the GLP took care of what? What do you think it did for her? Yes, I'm definitely not a doctor or a researcher, and I don't even have any type of medical background. But my daughter was in constant flight, fight, or freeze mode. You could just tell like her nervous system constantly thought it was in danger and she was reacting. And I do think that her brain was inflamed in some way. Every like holistic specialist I'd seen, everyone was like, oh, everything's inflamed, inflammation, inflammation. How do you get rid of that? You know, I couldn't do very much with her diet. And when she took this LP1, it was like everything just worked the way it was supposed to work. The combination of these medicines, right? So like we did have a good mental health drug for her. She, the lithium was, was working to a certain extent. Certainly. And then we added the GLP-1 in and everything worked the way it was supposed to work. Um, you could just tell, like she could just get up in the morning and do things and she wasn't agitated and she wasn't angry and she was happy to be around people and just social and normal and functioning. Like I said, she went to school every single day. She made straight A's. She loved learning. She was not, obsessive about things she would just eat food like a normal human which is terrible to say but it was just so nice like for years i haven't been able to keep any type of prepackaged food in the house you just rip through it no matter what okay just grab it she just grab it and go grab and go 
you know, it's hard to pack lunches for little kids when you can't have anything that's wrapped. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I hear what you're saying. Like, you, you can't be like, it's it's not Little House on the Prairie. You can't make everything from scratch. Um, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Which, I, believe me, I tried. <laughs> well, so the GLP wanes. It's not it's not really a seven day drug. You know what I mean? So, like, do you notice any return of problems like day six or seven before the next injection? Yep. You do? Yep. Oh. Absolutely. Are you paying for this in cash? Yes. Oh, is it like $1,200 a month? Yes. Are you wealthy by any chance? No. Oh. I just wanted <laughs> I mean, you to... We- I just wanted we to are, be wealthy we so I, I could feel better. <laughs> I just, yeah, I just yeah, wanted to no, feel better. Yeah, yeah, we are surviving yeah. doing this, but it is, it is tough. It is tough. Wow. You know, we're in a position where we, we can make it work, but it's the sacrifice of other things. Is she on the 2.4? 1.7. She doesn't even we've need gone, the full we've dose. We've gone all the way up, and then we went back down. How much weight did she lose? Let's see. She went from 240 to 160. Jesus, good for her. She's a little, a, a, a skosh over where the chart wants her right now. Mm-hmm, 15 mm-hmm. pounds, maybe. Am I right? Doing the math uh, in my head so. for the height. I think okay. So. All right. Yeah. That's astonishing. Yeah. Oh, she's so happy. She's so happy. Oh. She started a part time job last week as a cashier at the local grocery store. Good for her. Made and me cry. I, said, I just cried. Yeah. I hope everybody's. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah, you should. It is the yeah. best. Yeah, I did. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. So in your heart of hearts, you'd inject it every five days if you could? No, because we still deal with the other side effects of nausea and growing up and whatnot. I wonder if you could, you know, see, this is where I would love for a doctor to like be able to get a hold of this in a vial and you could mess around a little bit and try to figure out like what's the right dose and the frequency to really balance the nausea with the, with the impact you're getting. Yes, this is why I'm saying five years from now, that's what's going to be going on, mm. right? Don't you think they're just going to be like, here's a vial, this is how much you need to help with this. And like, if, like, I want her to keep taking it, but I don't want her to shrink. Yeah, I'm going to have like a Mad Max vest with it on, I think, in about five years. And it's just going to put in tiny little bits of it when I need it. <laughs> yes. I don't know if that's a reference anybody gets or not. By the way, we go via an inflammation reduction uh, back to our chat GPT overlords. We go via is a brand name for someone. We know what that is. GLP, receptor agonist, blah, 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 blah. Mechanisms of inflammation reduction. Modulation of immune response. Semaglutide and other GLP receptor agonists can modulate the immune system by influencing the activity of various immune cells, including macrophagia and T cells. T cells sounds like a cancer thing, doesn't it? This modulation can, I got to find out what a T cell is. Modulation can lead to a reduction in pro-inflammatory cytokines and an increase in anti-inflammatory cytokines. Reduction of oxidative stress, oxidative stress. The uh, GLP receptor agonist has been shown to reduce oxidative stress, which is closely linked to inflammation. By decreasing oxidative stress, these medications can mitigate the inflammatory response. Chronic inflammation in the brain, known as neuroinflammation, is associated with various neurodegenerative and psychiatric disorders. Semaglutide has demonstrated the ability to reduce neuroinflammation in animal models, suggesting potential benefits for conditions like Alzheimer's disease and bipolar disorder and metabolic inflammation. Obesity, type 2 diabetes are often accompanied by chronic low-grade inflammation Semaglutide helps reduce this metabolic inflammation by promoting weight loss, improving insulin sensitivity, and reducing the levels of inflammatory markers such as C-reactive protein. I'll be goddamn. Look at That's you. That's what it did. <laughs> well, f- how about that? Yeah. Yeah. You know who you're going to hear talking about this except for you on this podcast? <laughs> no one. No, no one's going to talk about this. I took I took it pretty hard in the ass last week for having a guy on who had... um type one for eight years. He's diagnosed by his doctor type one, eight years, 50 years old, diagnosed 58 years old. Now hasn't taken insulin in like two years because he's on um, uh, Manjaro and people come on. He doesn't have type one diabetes. I'm like, he's got, he's got this testing. He he does. He's got a, or he's got one of the markers for type one. Like, and people are like, well, it's moody. It's uh, it's Lada. It's I'm like, I don't give a what you call it. The guy was using all the insulin and now he's not using any of it. And whether this lasts for a week, a month, or five years, what do you care? Big picture, baby. Like, Jesus Christ, step back and see the big 
freaking picture. I got doctors coming at me online. This is very, oh, wow. uh, you got to be careful. You're telling people with type one, they don't need insulin. I said, I didn't freaking say that. I said, this is the guy's story. Go listen to it. And I think we even said in there, it's not a cure. He definitely thinks it's possible that he's going to have to go back on insulin at some point. Like, you know, like maybe he is just in the middle of a very long honeymoon. We all appreciate that. But for the love of God, he took uh, he takes an injection once a week and he stopped taking insulin. And the little girl that you referenced from the other episode, she was using 70 units of insulin a day and now uses four units of basal only and is not currently bolusing for her meals. Yeah. Like, what the hell? Like, I love how people's brains work. They're like, don't say that. I'm like, don't say that. We should be screaming this at everybody. Yeah. We should be telling people, hey, this lady's kid was in f-ing trouble and now she's not. And someone go find out what happened. You know what I mean? Like, so we can duplicate it for people. I didn't mean to yeah, curse and, that much. And that's but, what it yeah, is. It's yeah. not a cure. No. But it's definitely going to revolutionize how we take care of these things. It's doing so- like, listen, it's doing something for your daughter right now. Yeah. And, and it's incre- incredibly positive. You were talking about a kid who binge eating who's trying to kill herself, he's, I mean, wandered into a lake to stare. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like having moments that her parents are identifying as like going dark. You try living through that. Seriously. Like as her or as you and your husband or your poor f-ing kids, the other two who I assume are lived for a couple of years in a corner covering their head. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like there's a lot going on, right? I'm not wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, and, and she gets this. And look what all it's doing for her. And I'm going to bet you're going to tell me you've explained this all backwards and forwards to your insurance company. And they told you to shove it up and go pay in cash. Is that right? Yes, they did. Yeah, that is okay. what they said. Uh, yeah. They said, but we don't pay for weight loss drugs. I was like, I don't care. It's not a weight loss drug. <laughs> Does the doctor believe that this is what's happened? Yes. Our doctors are fabulous. And both our psychiatrist and endo wrote letters saying as much. I'm tired of people not being able to think like I get the insurance company. They're just trying to get out of spending the money that that's their. And that's the thing. I'm like, dude, do you know how much you insurance companies spent on hospital stays for this child in the last two years? Well, way more than this medication costs. Yeah, yeah, that one, that is probably your only pathway to this. Hey, let me ask you one simple question. Who are you getting the the insurance through? Is it your or your husband's uh, company? Right now it's mine. Okay. Is it a big company? Is it possible they're a cash payer? It is not a big company, no. I'm sorry. Because a cash paying company could override what has been set up in the plan. You know, that's a good point. Both my husband and I work for small businesses. He owns a small business and I work for a small business. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. His small business is probably making safe rooms, I I would imagine, because he probably did that a few years ago. He's like... (laughs) He's like, we're going to need a safe place to go at some point. So uh, I'm going to go into business for ourselves here. Uh, we'll build the first one in the house. It'll be the prototype. This is where the sales will go on, and then we'll do it for other people. <laughs> people who live or work for really big companies, I've, I I try to go over this as much as I can. A cash pay uh, employer would mean that they're such a big company that they really just use the insurance company to facilitate the payments. They set up what's covered at the beginning of the year, and the insurance company really just does what they tell them. Like, yeah. and and so you can go to your company and be like, listen. Put this on the on the formulary, please. And they can make that change if they want, or they can check off an exception. They can literally just call your insurance carrier and go, hey, listen, this lady's going to call you later today. This is her name. This is her kid's thing. We're going to cover the Wegovy for her. And they'll go, okay. And that's it. Because they're only doing what the company told them to do. In your situation, you're probably not in that situation, and the company is probably paying a one-time vig to the insurance company, and then they're doling uh, out the, the. So you got to find out if you're a cash pay or not. Does that make yeah. sense? It does. Okay. It does. I could definitely find that out. I mean, it's worth a look, and you know, because it, instead of like you're basically you're calling somebody who's been told these are the rules, and you're saying don't follow the rules, and they're saying sorry, don't care, because right. your company right. either paid us for this. Or is telling us to do this. Now, if your company's willing to like go that extra mile for you, then they might be. Now, what does that mean? Like in a cash pay situation, you're talking about another $24,000 a year, maybe, or more yeah. to cover your kid's medication. A big company laughs at that amount of money and says, yeah, sure, no problem. 
right? Like a small company says, I'm sorry, you're going to bankrupt us. So I can't do that for you. So you got to, you got to see who you are in that situation. Personal experience, my wife's company, when Arden was little, paid for like a $10,000 extraction of teeth to happen in a hospital setting because we couldn't find a dentist who was cover put comfortable putting Arden under while she was on insulin. Really? Yeah. They wanted to do it in the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. Our insurance was like, this is dental. We're not paying mm-hmm. for this. Mm-hmm. We were faced with a $10,000 bill and I went to the company and said, look, just cover this. And they were like, yeah, sure. No problem. It was, it was That's over in like great. an hour. You know what I mean? It was interesting. That's great. But again, a big company to whom, which I think $10,000 wasn't a problem yeah yeah Yeah. nevertheless it was a problem for us yeah (laughs) right no i mean it makes me want to want to change my my job path (laughs) yeah well i mean at least to a company who will cover we go over for weight loss because you're covered there yeah on that also what happened to her diabetes how how's the insulin use did it go down at all i cannot believe we haven't talked about this yet of course her a1c is better right of course Her A1C, when we were really, really tightly managing it, we could get it down to like 6.8. But when she was sick, it mostly hovered around 7.5. And then now it's 5.8. Oh, good for you. (laughs) Does she use less insulin in a day than she did before? Oh my gosh. Yes. Did that happen immediately when you injected it? Or did it, is it some of the, it's also the weight loss too? I mean, definitely, def- I'm sure weight loss has something to do with it, right? Mm-hmm. Obviously, when you lose weight, you're probably going to, you eat less, you're going to use less insulin. So there's definitely that piece of it. But there's this other piece where her body just seems to be receiving the insulin better. Yeah. Like it just uses it more efficiently. Does it really smash like mealtime spikes down to different animals? To the point that uh, she's on a T-Slim. Mm-hmm. We use Control IQ with our Dexcom. And... She, in fact, we switched to the T-Slim to get Control IQ because that was before the Omnipod had their, I don't know what they call it, their version of the logarithm. (laughs) Control Um, IQ? Oh, no, Omnipods is Omnipod 5. Omnipod, yeah, it was before the Omnipod 5 came out. So we we switched to the T-Slim to get the Control IQ, and that did help us, even though she was still very sick. So we're on the T-Slim with the Control IQ, and part of her mental health, issue was the the burnout from the diabetes care. Mm. And even on the T-Slim, she just wasn't entering her food and wouldn't let us enter her food. And it, you know, it was a whole thing. We couldn't even say, tell us what the blood sugar is or check the blood sugar. And we, we took off all of our, you know, our phones used to receive her blood sugar too. We took all of that off because we all just needed to take a step back and not be obsessed with her blood sugar. Yeah. Because that was causing a lot of tension. My husband and I both like to control things and we wanted to control the diabetes all the time. And that was her big thing, pushing against any type of control. Right. But look at So the- we'd all laid back. We had the control IQ going since probably October. So even in October, she'd lost a significant amount of weight and she was eating a lot less, but she was still eating, you know, she's kind yeah. of just normally eating. We just let control IQ take it. We never dosed for anything. How about that? Yeah, I just watched Arden miss a pre bolus like 45 minutes ago, and her blood sugar went to like 160 and jumped right back down to 140, and it's coming down steadily right now. And it, without a pre bolus, like, and without a GLP, she would have been more like 180, 180, 190 in that situation. Yeah. And, um, yeah. It's yeah. really something. Like, it's, yeah. Yeah. No, good for you. Listen, it's amazing. I can't thank you enough for doing this. This is fantastic. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your story and getting through all the hurdles that you got through. So you have the story to share because you could have given up at any moment in time. I wouldn't have blamed you. And instead you, you fought through and you got a real answer. Do you feel accomplished or just happy it's over? I mean, we still have things to deal with, but we are so happy that our daughter feels better and that she can be a functioning 14 year old. Yeah. I mean, I know you're always proud of your kid, but, you know, but to watch a kid graduate from eighth grade who has gone through so much and I mean, couldn't even go to sixth grade. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, mean, I homeschooled for a whole semester because she couldn't even make it there. Yeah. Um, make sure people really understand, like you had to pull her out of open windows, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. She right. was jumping out of 
we, well, you know, after a few of the windows, we had to nail every window in our house shut. Okay. Well, there, that's a clear description. Okay. So (laughs) I couldn't take her in a car. Cars were very unsafe. My whole family, the five of us, we didn't go in one car for two years because she couldn't be in a car with that many people. Hmm. Yeah, it was tough. Yeah. It was tough. And now, you know, she's going to school and participating and doing homework and taking guitar lessons. And God damn, good for her. All right. No, this was wonderful of you. I really, I can't thank you enough for reaching out. I can't thank you enough for, you know, shouting out the podcast about where it was helpful and everything like that. But I'm really thrilled that because I took a lot and I am taking a fair amount of crap for talking about GLPs. And, you know, you know, not from forward thinking people, obviously, but from people who are, you know, anywhere on the spectrum from, gosh, like, you know, uh, you're pushing the GLP agenda. I've heard that was lovely to <laughs> you can't say this, by the way, in case you wonder how I measure when I'm doing well, when somebody says you can't say that, I think, oh, I must be on to something. <laughs> So uh, I said a couple of times in my life with this podcast, people in the diabetes community, I'm making quotes because just because you say you're in it doesn't mean you're in it, have told me that, um, you know, what I'm doing is wrong and hurtful for people. I disagree. So uh, I've been told you can't tell people how you manage your daughter's blood sugar because that's dangerous. That turned out to be wrong. Yeah. I'm looking at um, when I get done here. I'm looking at a post from a person in the private Facebook group, an adult who had a significant low blood sugar incident at work and came to the podcast, the podcast private Facebook group to share the story. It's a harrowing story. But what I learned from just skimming it with my eyes is that this person had glucagon with them. They had a Jivo Kypo pen with them that they would not have had had they not listened to the podcast. Wow. Yeah. And so to those people out there who say, don't talk about this stuff until it's a hundred percent, you know, till the FDA says for 10 years that it's okay and blah, blah, blah. Like you're missing the point about how we get to these things. You know what I mean? People have to hear these stories. They have to go find out for themselves. I'm not telling anyone what to do. This isn't like, what is this kindergarten? I'm not in charge of people. You know what I mean? Like nothing you hear on the juice box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise, you know, like go take care of yourself. (laughs) But where are you going to hear a story about a lady who struggled to help her kid for all these years that had all the problems your daughter had and bing, bang, boom, at the end, she's doing a lot better. And it's because of lithium and a GLP. No one would have thought that. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm over here banging this gong about, I'm like, Hey, inflammation, inflammation autoimmune right like there's yep. no does no one remember maybe no one does remember back when i was writing the blog there used to be this um messaging out of some out of some researchers about type 1 diabetes and the messaging was always hey i know you think the um beta cells in your pancreas are dead but they're not dead. They're just inflamed and they're frozen. They can't move because they're so swollen. That was the like blue collar way I had it explained to me like 15 hmm. years ago. Hmm. What if there's something to that? Like what if wow. they were onto something, but they didn't know how to impact it? Right. And so let's say that all the cells in your pancreas are just inflamed. And because of that, they can't function. And then you take the inflammation out and they start working better. Like, is that's not crazy, is it? No. Right? Wow. So, yeah. you know, because right now we say things like her insulin sensitivity has gone down or the insulin seems to work so much better now or blah, blah, blah. But what if what it's really happening is inflammation's leaving the pancreas and like, I don't know. Like, you don't want to ask me because I'm I want to be clear. I'm a fucking idiot. OK, like like you don't <laughs> you don't want to ask me. I, I barely and I mean this with all sincerity barely scraped through high school. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I I know how to listen to people and I, I know how to hold a lot of ideas in my head and draw lines and there are lines to be drawn here. So I'm going to help people tell their stories so other people can draw the lines and then I'll sit back later while everybody else takes credit for it. And you know, <laughs> that'll be fine. Anyway, that's fine. Let's yeah, just yeah. get it done. Who Let's cares? Just... I don't care who gets credit for it. <laughs> As long as it happens, as long as, as long as they start covering it for your kid, so you don't go broke. 
Right. I mean, between the GLP and feeding that dog, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I don't know how you people are existing. <laughs> God, that dog must eat like a cat a day or something like that is what I'm imagining. <laughs> so um, anyway. I you feel were, like we're body shaming my poor dog. Listen, he can't hear us. <laughs> like, <laughs> he can't. All right, it's fine. He knows. He yeah. Knows. Listen, if he knows, send him my way. I'll apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I'll get him a GLP-1. No, we'll I'd be what? like, listen, man, you can't help who you are. I probably didn't know you knew you could hear me. Uh, anyway. All right. Thank you so much. Hold Hold on one second for me. Yeah. Thanks. A huge thanks to Dexcom for supporting the podcast and for sponsoring this episode. Dexcom.com slash juice box. Go get yourself a Dexcom G7 right now using my link. Mark is an incredible example of what so many experience living with diabetes. You show up for yourself and others every day, never letting diabetes define you. And that is what the Medtronic Champion community is all about. Each of us is strong, and together, we're even stronger. To hear more stories from the Medtronic Champion community, or to share your own story, visit MedtronicDiabetes.com slash juicebox. The episode you just heard was professionally edited by Wrong Way Recording. WrongWayRecording.com If you or a loved one was just diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and you're looking for some fresh perspective, the Bold Beginning series from the Juice Box Podcast is a terrific place to start. That series is with myself and Jenny Smith. Jenny is a CDCES, a registered dietitian, and a type 1 for over 35 years. And in the Bold Beginning series, Jenny and I are going to answer the questions that most people have after a type 1 diabetes diagnosis. The series begins at episode 698 in your podcast player, or you can go to juiceboxpodcast.com and click on Bold Beginnings in the menu. I'm going on vacation, and I'm bringing you all with me, juiceboxpodcast.com. Scroll down to the Juice Cruise banner, click on it, and get all the details. A diabetes diagnosis comes with a lot of new terms, and you're not going to understand most of them. That's why we made Defining Diabetes. Go to juiceboxpodcast.com, up into the menu, and click on Defining Diabetes to find the series, that will tell you what all of those words mean. Short, fun, and informative, that's Defining Diabetes.